Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, man? Going great, Rafael. How are you doing today? Great, man. Great. No, I cannot complain. I'm above ground, and that's really all that matters. You know, I'm able to uh, continue along and, and do what I'm passionate about. That's great to hear. I'm glad to glad to see you above ground today. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate your your vote of confidence there. But but really, really today, what I wanted to do was introduce a really phenomenal guest. He's a good friend of mine. His name's Tyler Chesser. He was a commercial real estate broker. Now he's focused primarily uh, on the investment side with his company, CF Capital. Uh, they primarily invest in multifamily assets in the middle of the country. He's also the, the host of the Elevate podcast, uh, which is one, a top 200 business podcast in the world. And just recently, he actually established the Elevate High Performance Coaching Academy, which is a high performance coaching academy that is dedicated to helping high performers take it to the next level. So elevate their performance further. As far as the things we dove into this episode, Tyler provided a ton of great insights into really his background in commercial real estate from the brokerage side, how that helped him translate into the multifamily space and really just become a, a full-time investor now with his company, CF Capital. We touched on a little bit about what a syndication is and how he was able to establish it such that now he's able to take down 200, 300, 400 unit deals. Uh, we talked a lot about mindset of high performance, uh, which is important in particular for him because that's something that he teaches real estate investors and high performers on a regular basis. So that was extremely uh, valuable insights. And really, we rounded it out to try to get a feel for you know how, how we can apply the lessons that we learned from this podcast to now taking action in the world or really talking about the compound effect. Uh, slowly but surely making progress towards your goals and realizing that if you do that over an extended period of time, you're able to achieve a significant amount, even in a relatively short period of time. So again, I think this this podcast is filled, filled, filled with phenomenal information. And I think you guys will gain a ton out of it. Uh, Jeff, did you have anything else you want to add? Just his knowledge and his, his experience uh, from what everyone can gain from this. I mean, you're talking about creating financial freedom here and, and just gaining back, which is very important is time. I mean, a lot of insights that he, he can give us, give you guys some things that we actually learned too as well. So can't oh, wait yeah. for you guys to hear it. Oh yeah. I learned a ton and I think you guys will as well. So without further ado, let's dive right into the episode. Hey Tyler, it's great seeing you. Uh, I know we we've talked on multiple occasions recently, but it's always good to see you and uh, at least virtually this time. So welcome to the podcast. My pleasure to be here, Raphael. Thank you for having me and Jeff. Great to see you as well. Good seeing you, Tyler. Definitely, man. Well, when we first dive into each podcast episode, we like to learn a little bit more about the the individual that, that's sitting across from us. So if you could kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of behind the bio, as you like to say in your in your podcast episodes. Sure. Yeah. Happy to do it. And uh, thanks again for having me. So I guess, to, uh, you know, kind of give you a little bit of insight on sort of who I am, what I've come from. You know, I grew up sort of in a middle class environment. You know, my my thought of success was always to get a corporate job and kind of climb that ladder. And so that's the approach that I took. Right. You know, I, I mean, as a kid, I was I wanted to be an NBA basketball player because my heroes were yeah. Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Steve Kerr, and then it was Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, like those type of guys. Yeah. But then, of course, my 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 talent did not pace to my <laughs> my expectations of myself. And so, you know, I'm still a huge basketball fan, but you know, I, I grew up and with that sort of frame of mind, and I got started professionally uh, working in the corporate world. And so, for a few years, I was uh, you know international marketing specialist, a market research analyst and uh, digital marketing coordinator. 
And so I was growing in the, in the corporate world and, you know, I visualized myself in a C-suite or, you know, in, in that corner office. And so as I sort of got more familiar with uh, the corporate life, I got more familiar with the politics of corporate life as well. And so I didn't really love that. And it took me a little bit of time to really understand that I began tolerating my life. I always say that I was kind of tolerating my life. And what I really mean by that was I felt like I was just kind of going through the motions after a while. And I was doing what I needed to do. And, you know, I thought that I was, you know, providing more value and I was hoping that I would become more valued by the organization and, you know, be seen and, and kind of grow exponentially in my role. But what I learned was that I needed to put a certain amount of time in that role before the organization would allow me to take that next step. And that's just the way that it was. And so, you know, I started to question, hey, is this the path that I really want to take? I decided to go a different route. And obviously, you know, we know each other now through real estate. And um, I got into real estate as a salesperson and, um, you know, started selling property. And, you know, along that path, uh, of course, I didn't really know anything about real estate as I got into it. I knew that I had some skills to connect with other people and to, to get familiar with the business and to navigate and to market myself, to market my services and to grow a referral-based business. And as I did that, I learned more and more about real estate. And as you guys know, you know, when you say the term real estate, I mean, you can mean thousands of different things, right? And so yeah. as I got more familiar with the income producing nature of real estate, I started to become very fascinated with the limitless potential that it could create for my life. And so I started to really get engulfed and, and, and immersed in the investment side of real estate. And so I started building a multifamily uh, real estate portfolio because that's what I specialized in on the sales side. And, um, you know, it continued to kind of grow and expand from there. And so now, you know, that's what I do full time. And I also coach real estate investors and entrepreneurs across the country. And, um, you know, I also host a podcast called Elevate. And, um, you know, we, we're all about personal professional growth, personal professional mastery mindset, as well as using real estate as a vehicle towards creating outcomes that you want in your life. So I've just become really fascinated with personal transformation because that's what it's required for me to go from an employee to an entrepreneur and an investor and someone who's kind of multifaceted. So that's a little bit about me kind of behind the bio. Definitely. No, and I, and I do admire you for a lot of different things that you're doing. Similar to you, I also uh, am big into personal development. And I felt like in a lot of these corporate environments, especially ones that are extremely established and not really a startup in nature, you're kind of pegged into a particular box and you're kind of not really allowed to color outside the lines. And as someone who's you know a little bit more creative, uh, you 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 almost want to be able to have that flexibility, and so I definitely can relate to that mindset or that that thought process as you're going through the transition from what you were doing before into commercial real estate. So that's awesome. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate that. You know, it is interesting because looking back, I wasn't nearly as valuable as I thought I was. <laughs> you know, because I, I of course I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, why haven't I gotten all of these other promotions? But I'm yeah. glad that I was a little bit dissatisfied because that caused me to take the path that was more, you know, appropriate for my life. And I didn't know at the time which direction I would take. I didn't know anything about, you know, cash flow. I had no idea about an IRR. I had no idea about a cap rate. I mean, as simple as that sounds and silly as that sounds, you know, it, it pushed me in this path to really gain those resources and the resourcefulness to, you know, continue to take steps forward. And, you know, I continue to take steps forward in directions that, hey, look, we'll assemble the resources, right? We don't have to have every answer today, but I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, definitely. And I'll even say on your on your end, the highest and best use, that's the term that we often use in commercial real estate to describe what the best use of a particular property is. But that same logic applies to a person. Your highest and best use may have not been in that role so that you couldn't have, maybe you couldn't have operated as someone who was maybe their highest and best use was that particular role. So that's something I learned when I was in software development and consulting. That probably wasn't my highest and best use, but now that I'm doing something else that's a little bit more aligned with my strengths, I feel like that, you know, hopefully the sky's the limit in that, in that sense. That's a really good point. And yeah, I'll stack yeah. on that because, you know, I look at us as people as value add projects, right? At some point in our time, we're distressed, right? Like we need to come in and provide capital expenditures into our own improvement, right? What is our NOI? What's our value? And so I think it's really valuable to kind of look at yourself in that capacity because look, you know, we're always a work in progress and each and every project is as well, but it's not like, oh, well, we have to be, you know, so down about that. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to take it to the next level. So I love that you brought that up. Awesome. So you said that you, 
were special and you specialize in multifamily real estate. So why did you choose that avenue in particular in real estate for multifamily? By pure luck, by 100% <laughs> luck, uh, because I got into business originally, I was selling houses and I learned very, very quickly that uh, the emotions of residential real estate were not going to work for me. And I was trying to figure out, all right, well, wait a minute. I doubled my income in six months. So that was good. But I didn't love that I was like having trouble getting property sold because of the color of the paint. And to me, yeah. I just like had this internal thing and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. But now looking back, obviously, I know exactly what was going on. But I started to, I was just really networking. Like, what should I be doing? Yeah. And when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, of course, you, you learn about the income producing nature of real estate. And then you start to look at everything around you in a completely different way. And I started networking and, and lucky enough for me, there was a group that was selling a significant portfolio of properties and the overwhelming majority of those properties were multifamily. And so I took on this portfolio to sell it and it was about a $30 million portfolio. And it was tough. There was a lot of tough properties, but it was a phenomenal opportunity for somebody who's willing to really get their hands dirty and really hustle. And so, you know, I was selling properties in rough parts of town in bad shape, uh, but some properties that were in great parts of town and in great shape. And so I learned all about, you know, what investors are looking for and how to negotiate and get a ton of repetition on a ton of deals. So that was a huge lucky break. But then, you know, it was, you know, it took me a couple of years to kind of really sell through that. But then I became known as the apartment guy through that. And so it was definitely a blessed opportunity. Uh, but then I just had to take the ball from there and run with it. Yeah, I understand what you said about emotions and commercial real estate and residential and stuff. So as a general contractor, that's why I stick to the, the commercial. It's just a lot less emotions and more about the, the bottom line. It's a big deal. It's yeah. a very big deal. Yeah. And, and obviously emotion can come into play in any situation, but more so Correct. on yeah. the commercial side, it's just, it's more rooted in some sort of thought process whether it's, you know, numbers or whatever else. So I can definitely relate to that. Well, and it's actually a really good point too, because yes, there's definitely still emotions at play. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the drivers are much more logical. Um, but I think it is important for us to recognize, even if we're investing in commercial real estate or all these different asset classes that are really income producing, we still do need to understand the emotions at play within ourselves and others, especially in negotiations, because people are looking to obtain certain things that yes, on the surface, it has to do with the dollars. It has to do with, you know, the investment potential, but the deeper level is so level. much deeper than that. So it is, it is really interesting for us to know that and really be able to influence other people. So yeah, there's a lot of levels to it. Oh, yeah. for sure. I think there was a study done a while back where they analyzed someone's that had a compromised uh, portion of their brain where their brain was. And when it was compromised, they had a really hard time making decisions. So they were able to determine that, you know, a big part of your decision making process is that you you use logic and numbers in order to justify making a decision through your emotions. So if you don't have that part of your brain that's that's operating at full capacity, it's very hard for you to even make a decision. So just because, you know, residential real estate, their emotional logic is, or their, their logic is, oh, well, the walls, you know, maybe red or whatever else on the investor side, it may be that, you know, their emotions more like, oh, we need to get a certain return in order for me to feel secure. And that emotion is, you know, security. That's exactly right. Or they might be looking for, hey, the reason why we're trying to get more cash flow is because I want to go travel the world more. And I want, you know, I've already got security. Security was way behind me, but if we can make this deal happen, I can go and do what I want to do. So that's a great point. So you mentioned that you first got started in real estate brokerage. Can you kind of tell me a little bit of your experiences in real estate brokerage and what some of the top lessons you learned that you're now applying in your, your other business ventures? Yeah, I got started in brokerage in 2013 and learned a lot. I mean, I continue to learn a lot every single day. And I, I tell my wife this every single night I go to bed, I'm like exhausted because I'm just learning a lot. And but I love it. You know, like that's what it's all about. Actually, that's the biggest thing that has been the biggest blessing in real estate is instead of like my every two weeks being guaranteed, I have to go out there and make it happen. And it comes down to my willingness to learn and to grow and to apply new learning. So as far as the top things that I've learned, it's about delivering more value than you expect in return. And it's about playing the long game. Like those to me are the biggest lessons is that, hey, if someone knows about me and they've heard about me, 
you know, I'd love to, to be able to deliver beyond their expectations in whatever capacity. And so that was a huge thing within my brokerage business is that every single deal, my philosophy was, Hey, no deal is better than a bad deal. Like if, if this deal doesn't work out, you know, I know on the surface and maybe many other brokers out there would say, you know what, let's just do the deal at all costs because I'm going to get a commission and, you know, you can go away after that. But for me, it was always like repeat business and referrals. Like I, my, my goal from the very beginning was to build a business based on referrals because I knew that if I took care of one person, if I got one opportunity and if I took care of that person, I really advised, I really went the extra mile that they were more likely to do business with me again. And, and in the beginning, it was a little bit of a like insecurity that, hey, I don't know if I'm ever going to find another deal to do. So hopefully you really like doing business with me and maybe at one point in the future, you'll do it again with me. So, I mean, those are kind of the big picture philosophies and the way that I try to treat people now, like in our investing business. I mean, we raise private capital from accredited investors um, to do our deals and it's the same thing. Like if somebody invests in one of our deals, let's just say they invest $100,000 in one of our deals and we tell them that they're gonna get an amazing return and they get a terrible return. Yeah, we got their $100,000, but they're never gonna invest with us again. So. For me, that philosophy rings extremely true in everything I still do, going above and beyond. The other things too, I mean, like the repetition of negotiating deals and really understanding drivers and understanding the nuances of certain marketplaces and certain sub-markets and uh, all that kind of stuff uh, was really important. I mean, I went out and got my CCIM designation because I felt like I wasn't an expert and I wanted to be an expert. I wanted to know you know, what am I really doing? <laughs> if I'm advising someone, you know, I learned from some of the greatest investors. Um, I've also learned some big mistakes from some of the more or less seasoned investors in terms of decisions. And, you know, there was times where I advised clients to do, you know, go in one direction and, you know, they wouldn't, and perhaps they would make a mistake or perhaps my advice was, you know, misguided, misguided. And so, you know, being humble and being willing to say, Hey, you know what, I really messed up there and really owning up to mistakes and really having tough conversations, uh, was really important. But, you know, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. I mean, that's, it's, it's been a total transformation in terms of every single day. It's a bit of a, a mountain to climb, you know, every single day is a mountain to climb, but I've had to shift my mindset from like, you know, just understanding that, you know, what every day is going to be smooth and some days are going to be easy and fun to guess what? Look, it's going to be challenging, but that challenge is good. And in every problem, there's a gift. And so for me, like the mindset has been so much more important than the mechanics. And the mechanics are absolutely important, but I got to check in with my mindset. Like, what do I believe is possible? Because when I believe more possibilities are available, they show up, they naturally show up. The people, the resources, the opportunities, the deals, um, they show up. And so to me, you know, it's been sort of multifaceted, but those are just a few examples. Oh, for sure. No, and I value what you said related to the mindset piece, because again, coming from a corporate environment where you're getting paid by a monthly basis, you kind of get in this repetition of like my my actions are going to produce an immediate result within a certain time frame. Whereas in the, the commercial business, it's, hey, you could work six months towards something and it could fall apart. And then you're kind of stuck back where you were initially if you have that mindset of kind of shrinking mindset. But in reality, those six months were extremely valuable to you because you probably learned a ton from the experience. And now you can apply that exact same lesson going forward. You can serve your clients better. And obviously I can, I can only imagine how much it's helped you in your, in your investment life going forward. I mean, it's going to pay huge dividends as you continue to search for properties and, you know, continue to grow your, your, your investment firm. So that's awesome. Yeah. And I'll stack on that again, um, because patience has become the ultimate, most important virtue. I mean, they always say patience is a virtue, but you guys know this better than anybody. I mean, a lot of these deals take forever, as you just mentioned, six months. I mean, some of these deals take multiple years. I mean, yeah. two, three, four, five years. Some deals like they'll fall apart and then two, three, four or five years later, they may come back together. And of course, you still got to be patient from there. So the patience and being willing to kind of live in that uncertainty and be comfortable with a ton of uncertainty and discomfort has been a really important lesson for me as well. I met Steve Galt and Charlie Marsh, uh, who's a commercial broker in town. And uh, I met them probably six years ago. And I'm just now this past month actually doing a deal with them. So you got to have the patience for it or for the long haul, or you're not going to make it in commercial. 
especially with the relationship like just oh yeah let, you know it's like i'd love to do business with you guys you know yeah. and if that ever happens that's awesome but if it doesn't i have to be okay with that as well i have to be Absolutely. willing to make introductions for you guys i have to be willing to be an open book with information you know it's not like hey i know all the deals and you don't it's about yeah. hey what can i do to help you and you know eventually it just i feel like it's been proven to come around reciprocity is a huge driver I'm telling absolutely you. Speaking of uh, commercial deals, uh, I'm curious of your first deal and what lessons that you learned, like what experience you had. Well, when I was selling properties, I sold multifamily. I sold, I sold a lot of multifamily. I sold yeah. retail. I sold mixed use. I sold office, um, raw land. You know, I did some leasing on retail and, and office as well. So I'm trying to think. I mean, the first deal, the first deal I ever did was probably a fourplex. And it okay. was a total dump. I mean, I don't know if that's what you want to go with. I mean, we could talk about retail or office as well. Uh, but the first deal I ever did was a, it was a total dump. You know, it was kind of in like the Upper Highlands, if your listeners are are local, uh, Upper Highlands. But it was really more so like very low income sort of sub market of the Upper Highlands. And uh, man, that thing was rough. It was, um, you know, four units kind of uh, up and down. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, it was like, you know, it had mold. It had mold in the crawl space everywhere. I mean, you know, we had to mitigate all that. And so, of course, you know, you're negotiating the, the resolution of that. And I'm like, man, this is, a, this is amazing. I'm thinking this is a huge apartment complex. You know, I'm selling an apartment complex. Yeah. And uh, so it was challenging, but we got it done. I mean, there was, there was tenants who weren't paying their rent. I mean, these units were ratty as all get out. But um, I would imagine that property is pretty strong now just in terms of where you know, the, the development and growth has gone. So there was a definitely an opportunistic buyer. I learned a lot. I actually was a dual agent on that. So I represented both parties. And uh, so I had to manage, you know, those emotions and expectations when mold was found yeah. and all those things. So yeah, it was cool, man. That was a, that was a good, good experience. How about on the investment side? What was your first commercial investment? First deal I ever bought was an eight unit property. And, um, it was also rough as well. It was way rougher than I thought it was. I thought it was, I always tell people this, I, I thought it was a value add, but looking back, it was distressed. I mean, it was total distress. The guy who sold it to me was like, he lived on property and, um, you know, he was a little shoddy. And, you know, of course, I think over the years, your intuition grows and you can sniff these things out and you can feel it, you can see, see it. But I was, you know, more green and, you know, wet behind the ears. And so I didn't understand that. But, you know, I think what he did was he, he, he kind of loaded the rent roll. And so I think he had, you know, half of the property was really non-performing and it looked like, you know, everything was good, 100% occupancy. And I'm, I'm looking at, you know, hey, what Robert Kiyosaki told me is when I buy these things, you know, as long as the rent outpaces the expenses, it's all good and you get the cash flow. And, uh, you know, what I didn't recognize is that the unexpected or the biggest challenges were uh, certainly possible. And uh, they all came true. I mean, you know, I had to evict half the property. I had to renovate those units much quicker than expected. And there was more problems behind the wall than uh, than I expected. It was the front building was built in like the 20s and the back, there was two buildings in the back. They were built in like the 60s. So the asset uh, vintage was not in my favor, but you know, I had a lot of electric work and plumbing work, especially in the building that was in the 20s. Man, I had bugs, I had roaches, I had drug dealers. I mean, it was crazy. I managed the property myself for the first um, six months I'm not even kidding you. I had probably, I would say at least a week of my life in there where I was like sleepless nights. I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, negative cash flow. I'm like, how am I going to, how am I going to hold the balance for this deal? You know, pay the mortgage and all this stuff. If, you know, it's like just burning to the ground, but those are some of the greatest lessons that I could have ever asked for because it was hitting me. It was hitting my pocketbook. And I was like, I'm never going to make these mistakes again. Like next time I do this type of deal or a bigger deal, I'm going to do a better job on due diligence. I'm going to ask more questions. I'm going to verify, trust, but verify. And so, yeah, I mean, there's so many lessons, but those are just a few. Absolutely. I'm sure getting behind those walls and learning about all the electrical and plumbing that that's, <laughs> you know, better than most Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately I do, but uh, I'm always a teacher when I, when I go into a building to you know, what's behind the wall. So, well, and it's, it's such a good point because it's one thing, if you know what to expect, it's another, yeah. if it just keeps hitting you in the gut oh, one yeah. after another, and it's like, 
you were so ignorant that now you're just like, I'm like, like you know, you got another $10,000 repair going on yeah. or something. It's like crazy. So yeah. it's important. Well, that's not awesome that you went through it, but definitely. <laughs> well, it's awesome experience. now. Yeah, of course. And it's colored your, your, your vision now. So as you approach the new investment opportunities in life, you're, you're ready to pull the trigger and know what you're looking for. So. Well, I can say this. I mean, I'm glad I made those mistakes on that scale and with my own money, because if it would have been with someone else, I can't even imagine what I would feel like if it was somebody else's money. I mean, it just, it felt horrible for myself. And I feel such a larger weight when we're working with other investors. So um, yeah, it's important. And it was almost like tuition in some ways, right? A hundred percent. So you've, you've mentioned uh, you were in the commercial real estate brokerage side of, of the business. You've kind of started transitioning away from that and really been focusing more on the investment side now. So uh, as, as you guys know, uh, Tyler is the co-founder of CF Capital, which is an investment firm that specializes in uh, value-add opportunities in multi the multifamily space. So I kind of wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, what was your logic transitioning over to that? And then can you explain what a syndication is, which is it seems to be what you guys are pursuing and what colored your strategy and, and why you decided to go with, you know, value add multifamily opportunities in the middle of the country. You know, when I was growing my commercial real estate brokerage company in my business, you know, it's so interesting because as I continue to grow, I continued to learn like what was, you know, realistic, what wasn't realistic. And obviously I'm always thinking bigger about like, where can we go next? And I was thinking about, I had built this, you know, database or investor base or client base that was kind of, you know, nationwide or, or international in some capacities. And, you know, there was so much demand for product. And, you know, I was, I was delivering upon that demand to a certain degree, um, but I was not delivering to that demand to a very large degree. And so I'm thinking, all right, well, how can I, how can I go bigger and how can I, you know, cause I was already investing in multifamily with my own money. I was investing with partners and smaller deals and larger deals. And then I was investing passively as well with other people who were scaling. And the more that I learned about multifamily, which I became very passionate about because of so many different factors. But what I learned was that scale is the name of the game. Like on the smaller scale stuff, it was great that I learned and made those mistakes on the smaller scale because it didn't destroy me. I felt like it would, you know, in my mind, I thought it was, but it truly didn't. And ultimately it was a win at a certain point. But as I continued to grow, each deal that I did that was a little bit bigger tended to perform a little bit better. And there was a better economy of scale uh, in that. And so I continued to grow. And of course, as I saw, you know, the performance of some of these larger deals that I was investing in passively, that really intrigued me. And so, you know, I just started to kind of educate myself on what that would look like. And, and I got this idea that it was like, well, wait a minute, if I have so much demand from a client-based perspective to invest in these properties where people are saying, hey, you know, we want to buy, you know, 100 to 200 to 300 unit properties, or we want to buy a 50 unit property, or we want to buy a 24 unit property, or we want to buy a fourplex. You know, to me, at the end of the day, what I realized is that real estate every form of real estate asset class, unless it's single family, is a vehicle towards creating an outcome that you want in your life. And so what these people were looking for were goals from a financial perspective, which then led to whether it's financial freedom, time freedom, geographical freedom, impact, you know, all those different things. And so I'm thinking, all right, well, I've built an understanding. I built a repet repetition in this marketplace. I can help people do more if I go out and assemble the resources and really get tactful on finding deals and creating deal flow and creating systems and creating a team, and we can scale and everybody can win to a, to a higher degree. Because what I was doing, I got so busy. It's like you almost get stranded by your success to a certain degree. And, and I say that hopefully with all of the humility that I, can, that I can bring forth, but I was almost stranded and there was only so much I could do on a one-to-one -one basis. And so I realized that if I assemble a team and we coalesce the resources and we all kind of win together that, you know, we could all have, have a greater future. And so that was really the, the decision making model there. And uh, so now that's, that's what we do. And like, you know, my team is out there doing stuff right now while I'm having a great conversation with you guys. And we're both kind of, you know, pushing things forward in different directions that are helping everybody win. So for me, that was kind of the decision, but it was, uh, it was definitely an evolution that, that we had to go through. Sure. So if you could elaborate a little bit on exactly how you guys focus, and, and I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's more the commercial syndication model. If you could elaborate a little bit on what that is. 
That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we do focus on, you know, 506 B and C uh, reg regulation D offerings, which basically means for anybody who's never heard of that, you know, there's security offerings for accredited investors to participate, you know, passively in these acquisitions with us. And by the way, myself and my business partner, we invest in every single deal as well. And so like, as an example, right now, we have a 250 unit deal that we just put under contract last week. And, um, you know, we'll be raising, you know, a little bit more than $3 million uh, for this opportunity. And, you know, people can invest if they meet the requirements of the Securities and Exchange Commission, they can invest with us as a part of that opportunity and receive, you know, monthly or quarterly, we'll see what happens on this particular deal uh, in terms of what our accountant wants us to do, but they will receive quarterly or monthly distributions in the form of, you know, call it 7% preferred return. So they'll get paid before we do. Of course, the, the property's got to operate, the property's got to, you know, service its own bills, its own debt and that kind of stuff. Cash flow will then be distributed to our passive investors and us as the general partnership will then participate in the upside. And so for this particular opportunity, you know, the passive investors will still participate in 70% of that upside and will participate in 30%. And if we hit a certain hurdle of an internal rate of return of call it 14% on this deal, then we've got an incentive to outperform that, right? So then we can participate in 40% of that upside and the investors will participate in 60% of that upside. So that's typically how it works. And uh, of course that's just in general, but you know, um, this is just a way for us to all win and, you know, and, and really to grow sure. more. So I look at a syndication as like flying in an airplane, right? So we can either go and get a private jet and pay, you know, $200,000, you know, for the fuel, for the staff, for, you know, all the different resources, the insurance, you name it, or we can go invest $500, $1,000, we can go fly to California. So, you know, with, with a group of other people. So that's the way that I look at syndication. And that's the approach that we take on, on our deals. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause you can achieve, like you said, economies of scale with a larger property and hopefully at that point be able to achieve a higher rate of return per individual person. So that's awesome. And, and I love the fact that you say that you also invest in your own deals with those, with your investors, because it aligns your interests together. And I've definitely seen people where it's, where they say invest with no money in a deal. I feel like that is not necessarily the best way to do it because again, the interests aren't aligned. So if things start going South, you know, what's your incentive to continue to perform with the deal? So. Yeah. And it kind of goes sure. back to the philosophy earlier was, it was just like, look, like this is a long-term relationship. Anybody who puts their trust in us and in our opportunities, like we do not take that lightly. So we also want them to know that we have skin in the game as well. And we already know that no matter what, we're going to do whatever it takes to make any deal, you know, win and succeed. Yeah. But we want them to know ahead of time that we have that commitment as well. So it's important. Speaking of the, like the investment opportunity, I'm just curious of like, how do you effectively source those investment opportunities for you and your clients? Yeah. I mean, our deal flow pipeline is pretty robust, uh, is the <laughs> most overused word in uh, the commercial real estate world, uh, robust. But the way that we do that is through relationships. And this has been one of the blessings of, you know, evolving from our career as brokers. And so myself and my business partner, Brian Flaherty, uh, both came from the brokers world. I came from sort of the you know, the more private equity space or boutique brokerage world where he came from more of the institutional space and he was formerly with CBRE. And, um, you know, we build a substantial network, um, you know, not only from the internal brokerage community, but also other investors and owners and such. And so we have a pretty deep pipeline in terms of deal sources. And of course, most of these deals, and we buy 100 to 300 unit properties, most of those deals are done through brokers or other property management companies. But you know, I'd say 90% plus of those deals are done through your top brokers. And so uh, for us, it's all about being top of mind. It's, you know, it's about developing those relationships. It's about them understanding that we're easy to work with. We get deals done. We don't retrade, we do what we say we're gonna do. And so for us, you know, there's there's deals that that are on market that are actively marketed, and there's deals that, you know, brokers have a very short time frame in terms of delivering, you know, a sale or a transaction to their client. And so they have a you know a handful of of their top clients who they will communicate with and we'll have some time. And so for us, the way that our internal process works is that we'll receive an opportunity, myself and my business partner. 
uh, will discuss, is this an opportunity that we feel is worth spending resources on to evaluate? And so we, we have an internal uh, underwriting and, and analyst team. And, you know, we actually, it's a consultant, a third party consultant that we invest in. We're on a monthly retainer and they, you know, they really go through our deals and evaluate, you know, what this looks like based on all of the, you know, the models that I just shared. And, and by the way, we, don't, we have not raised a fund to this point. So we don't raise the capital before we get to a deal, but we raise the capital when we get to a deal, but we have an investor network that's like chomping at the bit for our opportunities. And so, you know, I'm just kind of circling around a few things there, but as we get these deals, you know, sort of on our plate, typically, you know, I'd say a hundred deals need to cross our plate before we close one. And that's just where we are in the current market. I mean, most deals are overpriced they have no meat on the bone left or, you know, somebody else is just swinging for the fences when we're saying, you know what, I, good luck with that one. So, yeah. so anyway, that's kind of how we do it. But typically we'll, we'll look at a hundred, we'll really deep dive into 30 and we'll probably offer on call it 10 of those deals. And, you know, a few of those we'll, we'll make into best and final. Maybe we'll have a negotiation or maybe we'll get a few of those under contract and maybe something will happen during due diligence uh, but typically out of that set, we'll close one. And so that's just typically kind of our, our, our rule of thumb. Nice. And I think as well, you can kind of attest to this, I'm sure, but you probably have set criteria that you deal with on the front end to filter out those opportunities that you shouldn't even be messing with. Uh, and that Absolutely. saves your resources, saves time. And again, if you have to analyze 100 deals individually each and every time, that's going to be extremely time consuming and, and not the best use of your resources. So, yeah. And I will say that's a really good point because like, yeah, we have our acquisition criteria and we do try to stick really firmly to that. Now we'll say in 2020, there were some times where we had to veer off that because deal flow is not nearly as strong. Like there was not nearly as many opportunities and we still are opportunistic. Like there are deals, like we're, we're exploring a couple of new development opportunities right now. And that's not really our bread and butter, but it's something that we've always knew that we were going to grow into. Um, so, you know, we're, we're opportunistic and we're willing to capture things that make sense. But if they don't really fit our bucket and they're way outside of that, we're not going to spend time, energy, effort, resources on it. So now that we've kind of discussed a little bit about your background and everything else, I would like to get your cons or ideas on really the multifamily space going forward. I know you recommended a book called, uh, I think, big shifts ahead or great shifts ahead. I can't remember. I, I read the book a while back that you had recommended and it does provide quite a few insights into where the multifamily space is going long-term. I was wondering if you can kind of elaborate on your thought process on, on that front. Yeah, that's a great book. And I had the, um, I had the author on my podcast, so it was very insightful. And I think the big drivers in multifamily uh, are always going to be obviously, you know, migration patterns. It's going to be where is employment, you know, what are the drivers for people to live in certain places, right? And, um, you know, so at the end of the day, I mean, you look at like a book like Big Shifts Ahead, or you look at, you know, macroeconomic trends and patterns, and absorption uh, of different sort of asset classes. I mean, you look at single family, you look at multifamily, you look at so many different things, uh, whether it's, you know, mobile home parks, apartments, uh, you name it. And so when I, when I say, you know, where do I think multifamily is going? I mean, it's going to be different for every different submarket, right? Every different submarket is going to be different. And again, I mean, I would say always expect the unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if there's going to be a pandemic or some something crazy. So, you know, whatever we expect to happen, let's just go ahead and blow that up because it, it may not be re realistic or, or relevant. But, you know, I think the big thing is you look across... Um, across the country in the United States, you know, many folks are, are having trouble sort of saving the amount of money that is required to buy a single family home. And a lot of people still have a little bit of a scar from what happened in, you know, 08 and 09 in terms of the um, real estate and residential housing crisis. And uh, so a lot of people see, you know, perhaps other people who have had, you know, significant financial problems from owning a home. And, um, you know, so I think a lot of people like that flexibility as well. So those are just a few factors in terms of why people rent versus own. There's renters by necessity and there's renters by choice. So, you know, will the pandemic, you know, change sort of those consumption patterns? I would say that, you know, in some ways, perhaps, you know, at least in the short term, I mean, people like Chris Porter, who wrote that book, um, you know, Big Shifts Ahead, 
say that a lot of those patterns that they were seeing are just seeing, they're just seeing them accelerate. They're not seeing different trajectories, but they're seeing an acceleration of those patterns. And, you know, I had a, a woman named Ivy Zellman on the podcast as well. And she's a, a Wall Street analyst, one of the most legendary Wall Street analysts of the past, you know, 20 years. And she, she mentioned a lot of really interesting things as well. I mean, you know, millennials is one example. That's like a, a buzzword, right? What, what are millennials doing? And millennials, what they're showing is that millennials are, are wanting to own more homes now, or at least occupy homes more now. And so that is a shift that we're kind of looking at. It's like, all right, well, for the past decade or so, millennials have been like renters by choice or necessity, all of the above, like you can count on them. The expectation is they're never going to want to own a home. And now they're starting to build families and they're starting to think, you know what, maybe maybe living in a, in a single family home is interesting. So I think you'll see a little bit of that. But, you know, from a big picture, I would think that multifamily is, is still going to be strong. You're going to have, you know, still migration. You're going to have immigration and the, the population growth in this country will will continue to grow as far as I'm concerned. I mean, again, this is all projection, but you know, we have a huge shortage of housing in this country. We have a huge shortage of affordable housing in this country. We have a huge inventory of, of housing units in this country that still need to be brought up to sort of modern times. I mean, you have a ton of product that was built in the 70s and the 80s and even the 60s that there's still an opportunity for us to add value to. So, I mean, there's a ton of factors there. And, and I don't know if that really muddies the waters too much for you, but those are a bunch of the things that we kind of place sort of our, our our thought process on, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but we are very bullish on where it goes. I will tell you this, um, my partner and I, we were talking to an institutional firm recently, and they're raising a $6 billion multifamily real estate fund. And so that gives us a little bit of confidence in where multifamily is going. If they have that much confidence and they have that much firepower to be able to you know invest in that asset class, that shows us that maybe they know something that we don't know as well. And that gives us more confidence to continue. But, you know, it's a very competitive landscape on the investing side. A lot of people see multifamily as very safe and very certain in many capacities. And so that makes it challenging. But, you know, there is there's still challenges from the renters front right now. I mean, we're having some issues to a small degree on, you know, folks who have felt the effects of the employment, you know, drop offs from 2020 and so forth. So. Uh, there's a lot of factors at play, but I think in, to a large degree, we're we're very bullish on where things are going. Definitely. No, I think that's some great, great insights for sure. Absolutely. I know earlier you were talking about your mindset and how important that is. So in your mindset, what do you think that's played in the success of your company? I mean, I would say that it's it's been integral, um, yeah. you know, because... The, the thing that I go back to is like, I think it was Henry Ford said this and, and, and Raphael, you might think it's corny because I feel like I say it all the time when I'm <laughs> around you. But what he said was that if you think you can or you think you can't, then you're right. Yeah. And so, you know, as simple and as basic as that sounds, there's so many moments, especially in commercial real estate, where you can hear that inner voice that says, well, you can't do that. You haven't done that before. Or what if you fail? Or, you know what if you lose money here or what if you get embarrassed or you know what if you say the wrong thing and so for me like mindset has been so important the other thing too is that my mindset it's like a filter with which i see the world right and so yeah. i can either see the world as you know everybody's out to get me or you know there's so many challenges and there's not any deals and there's no opportunities and all this stuff or i can see it as every so often i'm going to see a new opportunity or in every problem there's a gift or in every new deal, there's another new deal behind that. And so there's just so much. I mean, it's hard for me to even really scratch the surface on this topic because it yeah. comes up in every single moment. Like when you ask me a question, you know, beneath the surface, my subconscious mind is telling me how I feel, how I think, and what I believe is true. And so like hacking into that and like planting the own my own beliefs that i want to believe that i want that are going to serve me rather than limit me has been so important it's it's really changed my life to be honest with you because every morning i wake up i think well oh man there's a lot of problems out there there's all these things and you know it's like snap out of it i gotta snap out of it and i gotta think about what is it what would actually serve me today what what is something that would serve 
my future self? And if I have all these goals, do I believe they're possible? Or do I look at them and say, that stresses me out and I could never accomplish that. So for me, mindset has been the cornerstone for everything. And, um, you know, when I hear somebody say, I can't do that, you know, I ask them, well, why not? And, you know, why not you? Or how might you accomplish that? Or how might you realize that you can do anything? And so I've, what I've realized too, is that, you know, when I surround myself with people who challenge me, that challenge challenges me to challenge other people as well, because, it's almost like a domino. It's like once you knock over one of them, it just never stops. And once an object reaches momentum, it tends to stay there. And to me, momentum is the name of the game. The compound effect is one of the most beautiful things. And once you have one belief, that leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. So it can go in either direction, but yeah. I'm extremely fascinated with it. Yeah, I could not agree more with what you just said. I feel like you, me, everyone, everyone has negative thoughts that enter their mind at a, on a daily basis. It's not something that people who operate at a high level struggle with. Everyone struggles with the same thing. It's just how they approach that negative thought process. Like anytime an excuse comes into my mind, I just think back to like my grandfather. My grandfather was... Uh, he was a laborer in, in, in Australia, leaving after the war. You know, he went through a lot of different rough patches in his life. And he would always challenge me if I ever made an excuse about anything. And that kind of got me in a thought process of like, well, you know, like it's, it's, it's probably just me making an excuse about something. It's not, I could probably figure something out if I just challenged myself to do that. So I really appreciate what you said there. Yeah, that's really, really yeah. powerful. I think about my grandfather as well. He was, um, he was a farmer. And, yeah. um, you know, at 40 years old, he woke up and he couldn't walk. And he literally, I mean, like he was a laborer his entire life. And he woke up and he couldn't walk. He couldn't use his legs for the rest of his life. He found out that he had multiple sclerosis. But the guy never had, you know, he never complained about it. He never complained. But in, and even at his funeral, I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people lined up to be at his funeral because he impacted so many people and he still was able to have a massive impact and it was all you know on purpose and with purpose you know everything that happens to us is happening for us and not to us and i think once we change that filter from i'm a victim to this is a greater blessing this is a greater benefit i mean everything changes so it's extremely powerful percent agree so a big part of how you operate in your life is, is through your commitment to personal development. I was just wondering if you could kind of provide us some insights on your, on the personal development approach that you have and any recommendations you have for other people that are wishing to achieve a high level of success or high level of performance in their life. Yeah, I love, this is my favorite topic. Um, for me, it's, it's always about how can I go to the next level? Because there always is another level. And one thing I've learned uh, and actually from people that are experts in neuroscience and, and biology and all this stuff, as crazy as it sounds, they have described and they have learned that human beings are designed to go big. Like we are meant to do big things. And if, we're, if we don't, that's really bad for us. And to me, I find that fascinating. So we've always got to be expanding rather than contracting. And if we're making decisions based on contraction, we need to check in with that. And so for me, I didn't really know that until recently. But now that I realize that, it makes it so clear as to why I'm so addicted. I've become addicted to personal growth, personal development, to having conversations like this, to you know, investing in coaching, to investing in masterminds, to going to conferences. Like two years ago this week, I walked on fire at Tony Robbins' UPW. And to me, like it still sticks with me because when I think about the next $20 million deal, it's like, I already walked on fire barefoot. I can probably do that. You know, it's like, it's all good. And um, as corny and, and ridiculous as that sounds, I mean, like those type of things and those experiences really stick with you. And I'm a big reader. I read all the time. I, I read a book a week typically. Um, so I'm always trying to devour, you know, content and information. And, you know, one thing I learned actually from a guy, he actually wrote the, the one thing, Jay Papazani wrote it with uh, Gary Keller. I actually also had him on the podcast and he shared something with me that was really profound you know, whenever I learn something new, it's not like I just replace all of my previously held beliefs. I stack them on top of each other. And so for me, personal development is about learning. It's about questioning my assumptions. It's about updating my knowledge when necessary. But sometimes I might learn something new and I might say, hey, that can make, you know, whatever that I learned before even better. And so, you know, for me, habits have been really important. And so like my morning routine, it's just, hey, I get up, you know, five o'clock, five thirty, 
somewhere in that kind of ballpark. And the first thing I do is meditate. Um, for me, meditation has been really important when we have so much busyness in our day and so many hectic things going on and all these different projects. If I can train my mind to be the observer rather than be the participant in everything, I can make better decisions. I can be more calm. At the end of the day, we get paid on decisions, right? And our life is shaped by decisions. So for me, that's really, really important. Um, and then reading, of course, exercise. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I can't handle stress unless my body can handle stress. So if my body can handle stress, then my heart rate doesn't go through the roof when you say something that offends me. I can just say, hey, how interesting about that. And uh, so that's really important. But personal growth is it's kind of like become like the cornerstone of my life as well. You know, having a growth mindset is like in every moment, it's like, what, what should I learn? Or what can I learn from this rather than you know, how has this been the worst thing ever? Like any problem can be a gift if we let it, right? Any any challenge, and, and, and there is always a silver lining if we look for it. So that's that's kind of my kind of high level, but I'm happy to go into any anything on that. No, no, I, and I think very important what you said, stacking on top of each other. Because I think yeah. I feel like a lot of people when they when they approach personal development, they see people like you know the Richard Bransons of the world, the Oprah Winfrey's, the the uber successful individuals, and they think there's no possible way you could ever achieve what they've done. But again, it's it's the compound effect. I mean, that book by Darren Hardy kind of changed my outlook on life. Where it's you know all you have to do is just small tasks every day, and things add up super quickly. I wrote four, five books in three years, and that's all because of the compound effect. You know, two, 200, 250 to 500 words a day adds up extremely quickly. And you can do the exact same thing in all different avenues of your life if you just take things on a daily basis and take that approach. So I think And awesome. I, I would love to stack yeah. on that if you don't mind, because Stephen Kotler, who wrote The Art of Impossible, um, he says that high performance is, at the end of the day, it is a checklist. And it's about stacking wins on top of wins every single day. And so, you know, I've got this thing, it's called the productivity planner. And every single day, if I can accomplish five things, five critical tasks, I win that day. It's so much more likely I'm going to win the next day. And when that compounds over a month, over a quarter, over a year, it's amazing what can happen. And you've set an amazing example with writing five books. And it's a great reminder that we can do hard things. And we were also meant to do hard things. Absolutely. And I know you said that you're avid readers. So speaking on the commercial real estate, what what's one of your favorite books? You know, it's interesting because most of the books I read don't have anything to do with real estate. Um, yeah. But I will tell you that if you want to, if you want a book that will make you a lot of money, you have to read Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, former FBI hostage negotiator. It's an amazing book. And uh, the other kind of opposite approach to negotiating, which I, think is valuable. I think we need to understand both perspectives. It's called Getting to Yes. Um, it was written by the Harvard Negotiation Project, I believe that was um, many years ago. So that one's, it's more of a an intellectual approach to negotiation. And Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference is more of an emotional approach. We need to understand both. And so those are both very valuable books. But you know, some others, I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, Phil Knight wrote a book called Shoe Dog, which is a memoir of how he built, you know, Nike and, you know, the challenges, the triumphs and tri tribulations that he went through um, to do that. And, you know, we run into challenges in this business. So it's good to have a reminder that other people have triumphed and, you know, gone through that as well. And they've, they've used those problems to become their own blessings. So there's many, but those are just a few examples. Yeah. And I'll back into that. I mean, Shoe Dog's a phenomenal book. And I, I'm a big reader of biographies. I love reading biographies of people who have done huge things in their life because it kind of gives you an understanding of what their thought process was as they're going through the process of building whatever they're doing. And I remember uh, Bob Iger's book was phenomenal. I thought it was amazing as well. So um, that's also another one. And we'll, we'll include some of those in the, in the show notes so you guys can check it out. Yeah, I'll add one more. Ben Franklin's biography by Walter Isaacson. Oh my gosh, love that book. Uh, Walter Isaacson is a phenomenal author. He's written many different biographies. Steve Jobs is another really good one. Um, I just love, I love that. That's awesome. Well, first off, thanks Tyler for, for stopping my podcast. Yeah. As kind of our rounding out, what we usually do is we ask our podcast guests to provide some resources to what, what's what we call the CRE treasure chest. Essentially, it's a repository of resources that are available for free to our 
listeners um, so that they can learn more about various different facets of commercial real estate and really, in this case, even personal development. So what exactly did you provide to the listeners? Well, first of all, it's a phenomenal idea. So I love I love what you guys are doing with that. And I do have two free resources. So one, it's um, for people who want to understand more whether they are active multifamily investors or whether they would like to become active multifamily investors or passive multifamily investors. Uh, we have a resource. It's an ebook, and it's a very you know dense and value packed ebook. It's called "The Bottom Line: The Top Ten Ways to Add Value." or increase cash flow to an apartment complex. Um, so you can get that over at cfcapllc.com. Uh, or of course, if you guys, I can send you a PDF, or you guys tell me how you wanna how you wanna handle that. But that's one thing and that's amazing. The other one is um, from a habitual standpoint, I, I mentioned how habits have been so important for me. And so I've become really passionate about, you know, if we wanna be high performers, we've gotta check in and understand that 40 to 80% of our actions daily are due to our habits, right? They're habitual. And sometimes they're subconscious. We don't even realize we're doing them. So we've got to have habits that are serving us rather than limiting it, limiting us. And so I created a guide and it's called Raising the Bar. Um, what this is is five steps to elevating your habits. And um, that's you can you can access that on elevatepod.com. And that's a free PDF as well. It's a workbook. So you actually go through this whole process of literally transforming three habits and it, it is a game changer. So those are just a couple of resources. Awesome, Tyler. Well, thank you so much yeah. for being so gracious with those those resources. I mean, I know a lot of yeah. people are going to gain value from it. Absolutely. I mean, I'm probably going to be one of them. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. How can uh, the listeners get a hold of you? Like, where do you, where do you want us to direct them and plug you in? Well, I think, I mean, if you're, if your listeners are listening to a podcast, probably the easiest way is uh, to go check out Elevate as well. Elevate sure. podcast with Tyler Chesser. Uh, we're, we're on every single platform. Um, so, you know, go check that out. It's all about personal mastery, real estate investing, and elevating to a life without limits as a result. And I know that may sound crazy to some people, but I'm telling you, it's possible if you believe you can, or you believe you can't, well, then that's true. And so that's what Elevate's all about. So you can find me there. Um, you know, you can find me on, you know, the different websites. I mentioned CF Capital, if people have interest in, in uh, learning more about those opportunities, just cfcapllc.com uh, or, you know, tylerchester.com. That, those are a few different websites. Of course, I'm all over social media as well, but many different places there. Sure. And we'll include all those links in the show notes below. So if you guys want to learn a little bit more about Tyler, if you have any questions about what we talked about in this podcast episode, feel free to reach out to him. He's super responsive and just a very awesome and value packed uh, conversations you can have with them. So thank you. Speaking of a listener to elevate, I highly recommend it for all mm -hmm. the listeners. You should definitely go check it out. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Well, thanks again for stopping by Tyler. Really appreciate your time and we'll see you Absolutely. guys next time. Absolutely.